Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Progressive Bitcoiner. I'm your host, Trey Walsh. And today on the show, we have Frank Corva. He's a journalist, he's an educator. He's working uh, for Bitcoin Magazine, writing a bunch of awesome stories about Bitcoin businesses and entrepreneurs and, and human rights for them, as well as Forbes Crypto. He's been a contributor in the past for Coindesk and so many others. So a lot of you might've seen his articles circulating around, especially recently on things like human rights, on Bitcoin tools, a lot of things that we love to focus on in this show and some of the most important work, I, I think, in this space. So I wanted to have Frank come on the show to talk about Bitcoin, to talk about journalism, to talk about Bitcoin tools. And Frank also has a lot of progressive friends, folks from the left. Uh, so Frank kind of joins a lot of us in, in what we try to do in terms of just educating uh, a mainstream audience, folks from the left, about Bitcoin, about its great human rights tools, about kind of the new paradigm shift in money and just explaining to people what is money, why our systems are broken. Talked a little bit about politics. Um, there were so many great moments of, of wisdom, I think, from Frank in this episode that I think a lot of you will will love. And I encourage you all to, to share this episode and follow along with Frank in everything that he's writing and share his awesome articles and really the global perspective that he's been offering. And thank you so much, Frank, for coming on the show. Really, really enjoyed this chat. And as I mentioned throughout the conversation, uh, we have a Telegram group as well. So if you have any questions or want to follow up with Frank directly, he's in our Telegram group. All of that is in our show notes for you to you know, ask questions. Uh, if you have any points from the show that you wanted to discuss more, that's a place where we can we can discuss those things in our open Telegram group. So all are welcome uh, to chat about all things Bitcoin, all things progressive values, and, and those things in our Telegram group. So be sure to, to join us there. And you can check out all of our promo links in our show notes as well for any of our, our products. So take advantage of those things there. And please, if you can, you know, like and share our podcast, subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast on our our YouTube channel, that would be greatly appreciated. And if you have any questions or any feedback, you know, reach out to me directly via email. You can reach out at hello at progressivebitcoiner.com. All right, I'll let you get to this awesome conversation with Frank, and we'll see you again next week. Hey, Frank, and welcome to the Progressive Bitcoiner. How are you this morning? Doing well, doing well. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It, it, we were chatting. It's it's an early morning for you. You're you're in uh, Vegas for for an event, but I appreciate you taking the time to to come on. Um, you know, and before we jump into this, what I think will be a robust conversation. There's just so much happening in the world in Bitcoin and the work that you do and and focus on. Um, some folks will know about you from your writings through Bitcoin Magazine, Forbes, other things. I feel like you've been popping up more and more recently with with some of these things. Um, but do you want to let people know? who might not know who you are, a little bit about you, a little about uh, about what you do and your background. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for having me on. And thank you for what you do. I think giving giving voice to progressives, I think it really, really is important. Um, if, if you like Bitcoin, it doesn't automatically mean you're like a Austrian economics loving anarcho-capitalist, or it doesn't mean you have to be that. So thank you very much for this. Um, Appreciate uh, for that. For me, yeah, my pleasure, of course. Um, currently, I work full-time as uh, the business correspondent for Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, for them, I also cover things related to human rights. Um, for me, Bitcoin is a place where sort of entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship and activism meet. So I think that it kind of makes sense to do this. Uh, a lot of really cool innovators in the space create a lot of technology that activists use, that people around the world use. And I think it's uh, you know a really great thing to sort of document that intersection. I also contribute to Forbes uh, on a part-time basis. Um, I was doing a podcast called New Renaissance Capital, where I focused on speaking with people from what often gets termed the global south. I have mixed feelings about the term, but um, it gets that's the common term in this uh, in this space. Um, spoke with activists, yeah, people from circular economies, um, and this is sort of my passion: is sort of telling the story of where Bitcoin adoption is happening. Um, who it's helping, if if adoption is really happening, or if it just sort of looks that way on social media, um, and yeah, that's that's the majority of what I do right now. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And you know, first of all, I'll stop here and say, if you haven't read Frank's work, if you haven't looked into what you're you're trying to do, there's a common thread here that that's just amazing. And I I appreciate you and and so many other journalists that I've been excited to talk to on this show because I think you're doing really really important work. And you know, as we go on with more FUD and narratives against Bitcoin, more crackdowns on on liberties and human rights around the world and our own country. These things feel more and more important to me and feel like they need to be focal points, whether it's regulation, whether it's 
crack down on human rights, all of these things. That that for me is continues to be the central focal point, and the other stuff for me is is secondary. But one thing I wanted to ask you, um, me myself, curious. I feel like I can glean a little bit. Well, what really brought you into this work, and what brought you into into Bitcoin? I don't always necessarily do a Bitcoin story with each and every guest, but no, um, yeah. I'd really be curious to learn yours. Yeah. Um... I was in human services and education for for a, a good portion of time. Before that, I was in the music business, but that's like a that's like a different lifetime at this point. Um, so I was a teacher for twelve years. Uh, I worked with UNICEF in Namibia. I did work in developing a trade school in a rural region of Ghana. I worked at a food cooperative in Venezuela. So a lot of the work I was doing had, I guess, a lot of people would think nothing to do with Bitcoin, but in retrospect, it had a lot to do with Bitcoin. Um, because especially what I was seeing in developing countries with currency debasement and um, just people not having access to financial systems, I didn't realize how big of an issue that was until Bitcoin, until Bitcoin sort of shined a light on that. Um, but I but I saw a lot of that years ago. So even before I get to Bitcoin, I'll say um, I lived, it's a very weird story, actually. I was, when I left the music industry, I was working at a restaurant. I became the waiter for someone named Lou Ranieri. Lou Ranieri invented a very interesting product called the mortgage-backed security, um, which is the product that collapsed the global economy in 2008 or nine. Let's say the misuse of that product is what collapsed the global economy. Um, I became his personal waiter because I was managing the restaurant, like I said, in between sort of it, while going from the music business into teaching. And um, he asked me to go to, he, he was friends with a Ghanaian priest from his parish, and he asked me to go to Ghana to develop a trade school. So I had a lot of meetings with Lou Ranieri personally. If you don't know who he is, the, the, the movie The Big Short is kind of based on him. He's mentioned very briefly in the beginning. Um, quite an interesting character. I learned a lot about what was happening globally as a result of that. And again, I, not because I was necessarily seeking this out, um, but just because I ended up being his waiter. Um, did work for him in Ghana, communicated with him frequently again, learned a lot, stayed in touch for a while. Um, and after Ghana, I moved to Venezuela. I had family there. And so I was living there under Chavez and I watched currency debasement happen in real time. I mean, literally on a day to day basis, just watching money lose value again, knew it was a bad thing. Didn't really know what the solution was. There was no real solution aside from like maybe figure out a way to get dollars into the country, which was also a challenge because they were disconnected from the SWIFT system. So even me with a US bank account or something, I couldn't just go to an ATM and take money out. So I would literally have to take like pocketfuls of cash when I would go to Venezuela and it would have to hold me over for a period of time. It was a really, again, two very sobering things. Um, fast forwarding to January 18th, first week of January, I'm sorry, January 2018, first week of January 2018. Um, I had given myself like a bit of a challenge. I was going to stop drinking for a year and I ended up at a friend's birthday party at a place where I probably would have been having a few drinks, whatever. And one of these friends said to me like, you know, you need to understand what Bitcoin is. Now this was like the peak of the 2017, 18, well, I would say 2016, 17 bull run. So there was probably a lot of conversations like that having like, you're going to get rich. Meanwhile, obviously we were about to enter a two year bull market. Um, and being a teacher and working in social services, I wasn't opposed to making any money because I wasn't making any money doing what I was doing. Um, so he explained it to me and I am, I was immediately down the rabbit hole. There was no like, what is this? Blah, blah, blah. And I actually, I, I was just telling this story last night. Um, I, I, I understood it from a social dynamic more than anything immediately. So I grew up in um, like the punk rock and hardcore scene on Long Island and New York. And for those scenes, for people who aren't familiar, you know, the, the places where, you know, shows take place are like VFW halls or bars at first places, essentially it's very DIY. So people do it themselves. They're very makeshift. They make, they make things happen. Um, they hand out flyers. There's really no sort of centralization, right? So it's, and I watched a lot of that sort of happen. I, I, I worked with one br uh, band back in the day that went from playing local bars in my hometown to Madison Square Garden. And my first thought was when someone described Bitcoin to me, I was like, oh, we're just at the VFW stage. We're not even at like the 500 seat venue phase. <laughs> like if it's this hard to use, I think my first time I used Coinbase, I had to do like a wire transfer or something. I was like, okay, I believe in this. And I think this is going to be really powerful. But if it's this hard to use, obviously like, people aren't here yet the, you know, the masses are not here yet. So this is a tremendous opportunity. Um, I had student loan debt, a tremendous amount, um, from doing, I've, I've 
I've completed one master's and I've pursued three others that I just didn't finish. And I was like, I just didn't want to be in debt anymore. <laughs> I just didn't want to be paying interest on my student loans and stuff. And so I did think about it more as a financial asset at first. Um, for about two years in 2018, 19, I just studied. I just read as many books as I could. And I often say this facetiously, but um, during that time, I had finished a degree in applied linguistics and, and ESL, and I was teaching uh, non-native English speakers. Uh, I was teaching writing courses at uh, mostly public institutions, public colleges. I was a public school teacher in New York for a while as well. Um, and at night, I was doing, uh, the schools would let me take free classes. And I was doing classes at one school, I was doing my MBA and another school, I was doing my MSW. So I was probably the only person in New York doing an, MS, an MS, MSW and an MBA simultaneously. And I have to thank Bitcoin for that, because I sort of, as I kept studying, I thought about how things would change, how things socially would change if Bitcoin adoption increased. Um, I was super, I was bored to death with the MBA. Um, I was inspired by the MSW and some of the work that I did. I was counseling Holocaust survivors. And uh, I worked with active drug users doing supportive housing for them. And I, I was into the work, but I really didn't like this idea that like, I was at Hunter in New York, it was it was almost like you just had to be a hardcore Marxist or like, you know, you weren't going to make it there. And I, I just couldn't fully get behind that. And I, and I thought I could sort of stomach it. But having lived under Chavez, having seen what authoritarianism looks like when you give anyone too much power on the left or the right, I just couldn't. I, I couldn't take part in those conversations anymore. And that was around the time that I just started pursuing writing full time um, in the Bitcoin space. I'm sorry if that was a bit long winded, but uh, that's that's a pretty broad overview. No, that that was perfect. You're, I mean, for lack of better words, a renaissance man. There's <laughs> so much, so much going on. Um, yeah, it's so funny because I, um, uh, you know, back, back in the day, I did my master's in nonprofit management because I wanted to pursue leadership opportunities and nonprofit management, running boards, uh, operating things, the development and fundraising side of things, the, the icky money part that really we need to, yeah. to run operations. And I was between that and social work. And I think similar to you, you know, I, I think, because I, I know a lot of the New York institutions, I even consider going to the new school in New York, like very like Marxist left-leaning things like that. And I see and understand their, um, their, their reasonings behind some of this, but it seems like you and I, and a lot of other folks that come in from the humanitarian side, yeah. the human services side, the nonprofit side, the progressive side, you know, yeah. whatever. Coming into Bitcoin, I think a lot of us are realizing and we're really looking for solutions because a lot yes. of the problems that exist haven't been working under the academic left rigor, right? Totally. It, it's, been, it's been philosophical and that's fine. Yes. But for me, I got tired of that. I wanted to see more solutions. So once I dug into Bitcoin and started seeing some of these quote unquote, market oriented solutions. And, you know, talking with for folks that listened recently to uh, me with uh, Margo and Troy recently about like, yep. love it or hate it, listen, like right now, we need to take action on some of these things, right? And, yes. and Bitcoin is a way to take action in so many, so many regards. So I think it's not even about like, let's diss a, a philosophical camp. It's more like, yep. I, I feel kind of common, uh, you know, common bonds with you over like, we're just, we're just tired. We want solutions. Like you were just totally. telling me how much you work on a daily basis is probably because you want to find solutions to things. And I, I think that's the common thread amongst a lot of us Bitcoiners, regardless yeah. of political leanings is like, God, we're really tired of seeing the world operate the way it is. There's a lot of pain and suffering. And, and totally. we think we found some solutions we can start, start digging into. Totally. Agree. Perfectly put. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that I find really, really, so you're in the nonprofit world as well. I worked in the nonprofit world, public service, all of this. Two things about it, two things that I find more refreshing about Bitcoin than I did about working in those worlds is that when you work in those worlds, they tend to be a bit paternalistic. They say they're not, but th there's a lot of like, here's a solution. And it oftentimes gets imposed on people. I don't, yes. I don't believe in that. Some people, yeah, some people are asking for that. Please solve this problem for me. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be sustainable if you're just solving it for someone and not sort of helping them, significantly helping them solve their own problems. But the other thing about it is with Bitcoin, the people who really get it and for who it clicks, there's this sense of hope that comes, that the future could be brighter. And I never truly experienced that. It, I experienced it a bit as an educator. I had a very deep connection with a lot of my students. I, you know, I, I worked hard um, to, you know, 
for, for personal reasons, I just wanted the job to mean something to me too. And I wanted to do a good job at what I did. But with Bitcoin, there's this thing. When I speak with people, I was, I was texting with one of the graduates from uh, Bitcoin Dada last night, which is the program that uh, who's Marcel Lorraine, who's been on this show, runs. And um, her name is Edith Mbukwire, and she's, uh, she's been sort of hosting Bitcoin Dada events in, uh, in Uganda now. And I know that Marcel Lorraine's vision is to have more and more people in different African countries, not just in Kenya, doing this work for her. And she's just, there's this genuine sense of hope and the sense of curiosity. And then I think there's also this sense of being involved with the international movement that Bitcoin is. There's probably little else that would have led me to texting with a Ugandan mother of three, you know, aside from Bitcoin, you know, who's, who's teaching other people in her community about it. Now, I've lived in Africa and I've worked with Africans. There are things that will sort of bond you, but I think that this does that. And I think there, this sense of hope and this sense that, okay, we don't necessarily have to be the victim of like bad financial and monetary policy. We, there, there's another way out. I think money, especially in the circles that we're, we've both been a part of that you're still more actively involved in nonprofit worlds, it just doesn't often get talked about, maybe in terms of like writing a grant and bringing money in, but the nature of money, how to invest money, these are like dirty words, and they're evil things. And, and for me, that was my life, too. I'm, I'm half Irish Catholic. I mean, talking about money, you get excommunicated from your family, you know, it's like, it's a, you know, it's a really sort of dangerous topic. But yeah, again, I, I just feel like hope putting something like Bitcoin, which is inherently financial power into the hands of people around the world. I mean, you've also had Luthando Nabambi from Bitcoin Akasi on. I, I, I interviewed him. It was similar to this. It was very early one morning because in South Africa, they have load shedding where their power just gets shut off for like, I don't even know, like seven to eight hours a day or something. So we had to do it around his time, which ended up being like 4.30 a.m. New York time. I'm, I'm based in New York. And he went into this. He went into this story about how Bitcoin caused him to stop drinking, to spend more time with his family, his child. Um, he doesn't waste his money anymore. He's not going to like the club in town or something. And he genuinely, I mean, there was a genuine reformation in his life. I, I, I had to sort of like go off camera for a minute because I started crying. It, it was one of the most beautiful stories I'd heard. And it, it speaks to what I really think Bitcoin is when people fully sort of understand it. it it's a catalyst. It's not, I, I don't think we should pray to like shrines of Bitcoin. And I don't think we should be like religious cultists and stuff like that. I don't mind some religious fervor because I think that's more of like the Bitcoin tribe defending Bitcoin. So I don't mind some of it, but we have to think about Bitcoin as a means to an end. As like, what is it, what is it unlocking within us? What is it allowing us to sort of give the world? What, is, what freedoms is it allowing us? Is it giving us back in our life that were being taken from us by, by money that was always melting or bad financial systems? And I think it's really, really, I, I just never found that in social services the way I do here. At the same time, it doesn't mean social services aren't needed. It doesn't mean that Bitcoin fixes everything. I, I, I reject the meme, fix the money, fix the world. I do think fixing the money will fix certain things in the world. And I also think it's really important to talk about all this with nuance, but I don't, there's no, you know, one solution like that, that's going to fix everything. If, if you guys want to hate on me, hate on me, but, um, you know, I just think, but, but there is a palpable sense of this affecting people. I was far more nihilistic before I found Bitcoin, far more nihilistic. And I, I may not sound that way. I was doing the work I was doing and everything, but, you know, I really did feel like there was less hope. And it's not just the fact that now I have something to preserve my savings. It's that humans can event, invent something like this. It's not just about Bitcoin and that it exists. It's that someone chose, someone took the initiative to invent it. Not, not even someone. It took 40, 45 years to sort of invent, to have someone put all the pieces together. Um, so yeah, the hope, the, 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 you know, looking at the future with a sense of like, with optimism and this feeling again in the Bitcoin space, you have to contribute. If you want to be sort of in it and everything, you have to contribute. And I think when people contribute, they feel a sense of self-worth and, and, and this tends to bring that out in them. So. Yeah, completely. Um, gosh, you said so much there and, and, and I'm glad you said all of it. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm curious you take on this. I, I have a feeling you'll agree with it. You know, when I, when I first got into to Bitcoin, you know, not, not that long ago, early 2021, um, the first year was quite a bit of like, all right, you're progressive. Yeah, right. How's that going to work? Right? right. You know, a lot of that, a lot of that. I, then I think people saw me sticking around, saw what I was talking about. And they're like, okay, 
we'll, we'll back off a little bit or whatever happened. I'm, I'm not sure. Right. I started engaging a little different, wasn't trying to be as trolly or, tr- you know, th- this and that. Right. But, f- but for me, I think what a lot of people underestimate, if there's any, you know, longtime Bitcoiners or folks that aren't progressive listening to the show and, and things like that, and there are quite a few that listen to the show. They like the guest or they're open to different ideas, which is fantastic. Um, I think for a lot of people to know that you'd be surprised, I'd say the majority of progressives I know and my friends from the left, progressives, whatever, for a long time now, have been very frustrated with the systems, very frustrated with how the world has been going, how our country has been going, not really rah-rah Democratic Party or or certain political party, but they don't know where to turn to, right? I, I think they're conditioned as I was, as maybe you were as well, to think of certain ways about money, think of certain ways about capitalism or markets. Yep. Um, and, and by the way, I think, I think Bitcoin, I view that I ascribe that tool mentality to it as well. Like Bitcoin is a tool. Yep. It is not a philosophical camp. It is not a particular economic camp in a lot of regards. I think there's many different varieties. Some of the best Bitcoiners I know are, you know, libertarian socialists. I think there's a lot of different arguments to be had here, right? So I'm not articulating a particular model with it, but I think a lot of progressives are conditioned to automatically think and I know you know this in journalism as, as well, sure. about any environmental impacts of using energy, about money in general or anything. If Wall Street is, you know, involved with it at this point, anybody can own and hold Bitcoin. So ETFs are a huge thing. I think a lot of progressives are, are have a knee-jerk reaction to some of these topics initially. But digging in just a little bit, it did not take me much because I was in that camp before I got into Bitcoin. I was like, crypto bros, like, what? Well, this is not for me. Like, I was similar <laughs> to you. I had student loan debt. So I was like, I don't want to be in debt forever, but then I just heard a little bit about the human rights. I heard a little bit about, we don't have to trust banks anymore. We don't have to real, you know, like, um, you know, completely put trust in authority figures or governments or things like that, that have continuously lied about how they're going to save the planet, about how life is going to get better for the middle and low class, all of these different things, right? Uh, Especially after shutting out Bernie for a lot of us, (laughs) you know, in that that group. Yeah, yeah. For me, I kind of detached from politics shortly after that. And I'm like, this is, uh, be honest, I thought this is quite the scam. So I think I'm still holding out that there's so many folks in that camp that once they start learning about Bitcoin, it's just, as you said, that catalyst that will start moving. And then they use it as a tool in their own lives. They, they become more hopeful yep. about a future that looks a little different. And it's not just about Bitcoin, the thing. It's about, okay, it reinvigorates their sense of, I'm going I'm to try more at this. I'm going to wake up every day and go pursue something. I'm yep. going to do something for my community. I'm going to pursue this new job. I'm going to start a nonprofit focusing on that, you know, whatever. It reignites a passion in people. That's that's what it did for me, at least. Totally. Yeah, I'm, I'm super happy to hear that. And everything you said is super important. Um, and I know that there's a deep reluctance for people to come to this because capitalism is a dirty word. And on a certain level, I agree. I mean, you know, People were part of the capitalist system. We we had slaves in the United States. There there's a there's obviously a reason that the, there's a negative connotation to this word. There is um you know there huge there is huge amounts of inequality in the states. Some people don't necessarily understand that part of the reason, not the entire reason, is the fact that that has to do with the nature of money and the Cantillon effect and who gets the money and how they invest it. And you know you can look at any chart and you can see sort of how inequality has you know, risen since 1971, when we went off the gold standard. Um, Again, I I don't think being on a Bitcoin standard means that you don't need anything, no taxes, no this, that's not the point of it. It's just to say like, no, the money that you're going to use is going to retain value over time, which is just radically different than the world we're living in right now. But I think you had you had Lynn Alden on about she I believe she spoke about this, where, you know, I think it was called what the left gets wrong about money. And I think with Bitcoin, a lot of people, and I think partially because, you know, the early days of it, it was just like, it was either developers or like super hardcore libertarians that were into it. That was it, period. Like the first epoch, 2009, 2012, that was it. And that's probably someone may have heard it, you know, heard about it sort of on the periphery. And then they were like, no, that's not me sort of thing. So I actually, for this reason, I don't use the term capitalism anymore. When I talk about this, I talk about the idea of a market economy and the concept of price and a market economy being a counter to to totalitarianism. So it's not about, you know, capitalism. It sounds like we're just all in this pursuit of obtaining as much capital as possible. I I may sound naive or dumb in saying this. That's not the pursuit that I'm here. That's not what I'm pursuing with my life. 
Will, do I want some capital? Sure, of course. I'd love to be able to retire, you know, be debt free, all this kind of stuff for sure. Do I want a Lambo? No, I don't. I don't even, I w- wouldn't know where to park it. Don't want to take care of it. And it's like, you know, that's, that's not the point. But having freedom is the point. And, and I think freedom is, again, this word that gets thrown around. It sounds like a far right rallying cry. Like, well, we're, we're fighting for freedom. We're, you know, we're this because it's been co opted. It's not though. Freedom is a massively important thing. What I saw in Venezuela, it wasn't even at the worst point yet. It was brutal. And I lived in what's called a barrio there, which is the, these are like favelas in Brazil. These are the poorest neighborhoods um, in the country. And so I was, I was a teacher in that barrio. This takes a really bad toll on things when stuff gets bad, you know, when, when things around money get bad financially. So while I was living there, three of my neighbors were murdered. They were, they were shot to death. This is, these are the effects of when stuff goes wrong with money and, and, you know, when there's, where's economic stress and things like that, when people don't have opportunity. And I think that while Bitcoin doesn't solve everything, it does give people a certain sense of, of opportunity. And when you think about things from like an inverse system, a socialist system where things are centrally controlled, and I would even argue that in the United States, we do have a social, we have a socialized financial system. There's no question. If, if there's no downside in capitalism, you know, in, 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 in a market economy, it's a socialist system. So what we're seeing now is, you know, uh, obviously we're seeing inequality continue to rise there, you know, it leads to higher poverty rates and all this kind of stuff. I would argue that that's a result of centralization of power. And I think that that's the bigger thing to sort of look at when you talk about, when we talk about money and stuff like that, it, it's not about uh, thinking about it in terms of left and right perspective. It's just about and like how, how few people are making decisions about this. And with Bitcoin, there's a lot of people making decisions. Each node is making a decision. And I think that that's really important. And when I point out to my friends, I just had a conversation with a really good friend of mine, Phil Benet, who's you know very much on the left. And he came to me finally and was just like, all right, I got to understand this Bitcoin thing. It's not going away. Can you explain it to me a little bit? I said, yeah. And, and when, in, in explaining it, you know, I think he started to get it. And, and I also, you know, he, he began to, but I also sort of, I brought up the, the example of, um, of Switzerland. So Switzerland is, you know, it's a market economy, but Sw- for Switzerland for people who don't know, it's actually, it's not even technically a country. It's a series of, uh, it's a, it's a federation and it's a, it's a, it's a collection of what are called cantons. And each of these cantons are like jurisdictions where people vote and they they vote hardcore at a local level. So essentially all these decisions get made at a local level. And then those decisions sort of go up the funnel. And I think they have 12 different prime ministers or something. It's a highly decentralized country. In Switzerland, the poverty rate is super low. But I think a lot of it is that there's all of this involvement at the local level. They still have a market economy. It's a bit of an expensive place to live. But there's also a strong social safety net because people make decisions about what they really need at a local level. So if they do want, I don't know, more support for healthcare or whatever it is, they can make those decisions and they have a voice. So I, I tried to use Switzerland as an example. Like if you want a country where poverty is low, because oftentimes people jump to like, well, the U.S. needs to be more like these Nordic countries, Sweden and Denmark, where, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, where there's no poverty and there's a strong social safety net, this and that. The other, the thing about that is that Sweden and Denmark take like the majority of their Muslim population and put them on an island, like off the coast of the, I'm sorry, I think in Denmark it is. I'm not going to say one of the, one of these Nordic countries, you know, does that. There's, there's a lot of cultural homogeneity in these places and there's a lot of like straight up racism. So, you know, if that's what your model is, you're talking about a place where there's 5 million people living in the country where there's a lot of division on a social level. The United States is not like this. It's a much bigger country. There's people living, you know, of different ethnicities, different heritages living amongst each other. It's not a great model. So I think when people think of a model, the idea for me is like, no, like Switzerland is something that works and that I want people to be involved in the local levels of politics, have a say, hopefully have that affect things. Unfortunately, that's not really how things work in the United States. I could still, you know, hope that they move in that direction one day. Um, but yeah, again, like when I have these conversations with people, I think it's really important to differentiate between the nature of money and then the distribution of money. We, we're already seeing that you can pay your taxes in places like Prospera in Honduras, which is like a, a special economic zone where Bitcoin is legal tender. You can pay your taxes in Bitcoin. You can pay your taxes in Bitcoin in El Salvador. So it doesn't mean it's the end of taxes. It's it's a perfect utopia. It's not. No system is a utopia. So I just think it's it's important to 
to have those conversations with people to just sort of, you know, get into, but, but then again, like, you know, who amongst us <laughs> was brought up having conversations about the nature of money? You know, no one, none of us were. So, you know, this is all new. And, and I think it's best to approach it with that mindset too. You know, we're, this is all really, really new for some of us. I've been in this space for six and a half years. It's obviously a little less new to me, but the other side of it is that you and I, we both have master's degrees. We have some, we have some space in our life to be intellectually curious Whereas most people don't, a lot of people work a lot, whether they're, they're working two or three jobs or, or they're working and then taking care of a family, they're not going to sit down and read like the Bitcoin standard or, or some book on economic, it's just, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't, I'm just talking about reality here. It's, it's just, you know, it's up to us to, I think, try to make this stuff as digestible as possible for people, um, to try to sort of help people have an experience of using Bitcoin, saving with it for, you know, hopefully holding it for a few years, seeing their value increase or whatever. Um, Because I think that versus getting into the philosophy behind things and everything else, you know, it's better to sort of maybe give people the experience and say, hey, this thing isn't so bad. It's helped me preserve some purchasing power. Or maybe I did some sort of international remittance for cheaper than I would have with Western Union or something like that. So it's a lot. But then on the other side of that is like, you and I only have so much time, right? Like we, we can't be everywhere all at once. You know, it's, it's emotionally, you know, this often doesn't get talked about. I'm sorry if I'm just like riffing too far off the initial point, but emotionally it's sort of a difficult position that you and I are in. I'm not complaining or whatever, but we're having very conversations around money are very emotional conversations. Like maybe sometimes the, you know, super emotional. So, you know, we're playing a role sort of teaching people about this thing knowing in the back of our minds, or maybe in the front of our minds that there's going to be another 50, 60% drawdown. We don't necessarily know when that's going to happen. That person's going to look at us and be like, you're a scammer. You're a, you're why, why did you get me into this? My dollars were fine, or this was fine, blah, blah, blah. So there's so many components to sort of explaining what this is to people to sort of helping them hopefully have a good Bitcoin experience to making them think differently about their politics to not just saying like, no, you know, the government needs to be in control of everything and fix everything. Um, there, there's a lot, there's so much that goes into it. And I think, um, you know, for everyone out there who is an educator, who is trying to help people who, who probably has been through that emotional roller coaster of, you know, feeling ashamed when the price dropped or something like that. And, you know, you just told someone about it, then it went down. It's not on you. Deep down, I think people, the people in this space are, are trying to help others and, and, you know, and also, like you said, trying to shift mindsets. You know, we, if you grew up being progressive or, you know, my heroes are, I had an aunt and uncle. My aunt was a nun who worked with the Sandinistas and went during the revolution in the 70s in Nicaragua. Um, I have another aunt and uncle that, uh, did work. That was the reason I was in Venezuela. They did work in a barrio there. They brought f- their four children down there in the eighties and worked with, you know, a food cooperative and the school system there. Um, you know, th- they're, they hate Bitcoin, both of them, you know, they're, they're, they're traditionally on the left. They think that the government should fix things. And, and on a certain level, it should, don't get me wrong. It should. I mean, that's what we're paying taxes for. Right. Um, on another level, you know, old systems are breaking. We're at what get often get often gets termed like a fourth turning or something like that. New technologies are arising. Those new technologies, you know, oftentimes people just are skeptical of them or they don't know what they are. And it also just takes time. You know, it, it takes time for us to sort of shift mentalities and for sort of our political orientations to to realign. And I also wanted to say one thing you said about Bernie. And uh, Herman Vivier, who uh, who's also uh, part of the Bitcoin Akasi movement, he was in New York and we were having a conversation and I hadn't really put this together, um, but he spoke a little bit about Bernie. I didn't know he was following pretty closely, I guess, you know, the elections here as people around the world tend to do, um, you know, and he, and he put, he said, there's a lot of like Bernie supporters that have come to Bitcoin um, because they were passionate about change. And he said, you know, under Obama, not a ton changed, like healthcare was good. Um, you know, it, it, it's been helpful to me, I'll say in the times that I haven't had a job uh, to, to not have to pay out of pocket for health, for healthcare, but, um, not a ton changed. Um, we know that sort of banks help put him in power, which is sort of, you know, it's not a great feeling. Um, and then Bernie comes along and whether you like him or not, he's been saying the same thing for like a hundred million years, you know, he's got his stance and that's what it is. Um, 
and we watched what the DNC did to him. We watched it. We watched it happen in real time. And, you know, Herman said, like, you know, we watched that too. And we were just like, okay, you know, there was a feeling of like, all hope is lost. And I think a lot of people who were Bernie supporters on that side, you know, who came to Bitcoin, I think they, whether they knew that that's what they felt or not, whether they had articulated that to themselves, that was the feeling, you know, it's like, okay, if you guys aren't going to allow real change to happen, we're just going to do this ourselves. So I'm sorry, that was a little bit all over the place, but I appreciate your listening. No, that was fantastic. I, I think our, our listeners are going to absolutely love that um, and, and have a lot of thoughts on that. I, I think too, what I try to tell to people, again, I think a lot of people in the left or progressives will know this, but f- you know, the reason there are so many Bernie, former Bernie, whatever supporters um, are from that paradigm in Bitcoin is because a lot of us, uh, we're progressive or the left we we have that's why i keep talking about progressive values not like we'll never endorse a politician we'll never endorse a a political party i've said a million times i'm a registered independent there's so many ways so many of us are are not attached to that system but we what we do care about are our values we care about wealth inequality we care about marginalized communities we care about lgbtqia rights we care about immigrant rights we care about the environment there's a lot of values And I I wish more in the kind of broader or or a bit niche kind of, you know, U.S.-based libertarian Bitcoin community would understand progressives aren't latched on to we have to have a centralized government. There are some intellectual progressives on the Internet or in mainstream media that are. That is not the majority of people. The majority of people that are progressive, maybe not even consider themselves that, but have typically voted Democrat or are, you know, part of like different Occupy movements and Black Lives Matter movements. We care about these value sets. And I think many of them would be open to solutions that that take care of those of those values. And that for me, I found a lot of that in Bitcoin. Not just in Bitcoin, but a lot of smart Bitcoiners that are in the space. You know, Bradley Rettler was huge for me initially. Troy Cross, um, Margo Paez, a lot of folks kind of from that left or green party or or, yep. or movement that are like, listen, we're tired of sitting around. We're t- we're taking okay. action. And I'm like, hell yeah. That's that's what I'm talking about because yep. I'm tired of listening to people, <laughs> listening to Elizabeth Warren, listening to others that have talked about change. And then, and then they're just career politicians or they're totally. just, they're career politicians at worst, uh, at, at, you know, at, at best they're uneducated, right. On, on some of these things. So I right. think there's a lot of people that are still just waiting to hear and, and waiting to tap in. There's a different way to do things. And I think that's what we're, we're here about. And I, I think they truly would be open to it. Uh, people are in a lot of pain. And, yeah. they're, and they're searching. That's for sure. They're in pain over climate change, over climate crisis, you know, young people's movements. One of the first articles I ever wrote was Bitcoin is um, money for a you know a, a generation. Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name of it now. Hope for a generation found hopeless. Yeah, uh, and kind of just the philosophy of inequality. You know, we're, we're, the millennials are one of the first generations that will be on average poorer than their parents. Yep. Uh, a lot of things that are that are very paradigm shifting. So there's a lot of internalized pain in, in a generation yep. and confused on where it came from. You were talking about the nature of money. That's a great place to start. Right. And I think if we just get everyone in the room, hypothetically, we're saying, okay, the system's broken. Now let's talk about it. That does not mean everyone in Bitcoin is going to agree on the same social safety nets, the same ways. I will say there is not one way to do this. The Bitcoiners that say you have to be a US-based libertarian like Austrian, uh, and I'm, no, Bitcoin is a tool. There's a variety of different we, ways to structure societies, to structure taxes and, and a Bitcoin standard, all of these things yep. that, that can work. Switzerland's an interesting example that you mentioned, but I think we got we to gotta just say, okay, the system's broken. Okay, that's step one. Step two, there's this thing, Bitcoin. It's not going to fix everything, but, but it's a good start. Let's yep. talk about it. And totally. that's, I think, where we're at is like just starting to see, okay, Bitcoin might be a solution. I think that's it. And I, I I wouldn't even say might be, I would say it already is in that, um, you know, for remittances or, or, or also as like, uh, you had Ludmila Kaslavska on and, you know, as a money of last resort and a network, not just a money, but also a network, which is again, often not part of the conversation. People often talk about Bitcoin just as an asset. They don't talk about it as much as a permissionless network, which means you can use it just as a network, transfer your Bitcoin back into whatever local fiat currency if you want. But do, doing so, you can, you know, you don't have to put it through a bank or Western Union or something like that, which I think is a net positive for society. 
Um, but, you know, w- with activists around the world, I recently spent some time with Anna Chekovic from the Anti-Corruption Foundation, and, and I know Ludmila well. Um, obviously, Gladstein has had a big impact on my life, and I really appreciate what he's done, you know, bringing the message he's brought to the world with, you know, Bitcoin and human rights. Um, it is solving very, very real problems. Um, the one, uh, James Baldwin has a quote, like, it's probably not just attributed to him, but, you know, rights are not given given to you by the powers that be. They're only taken away by the powers that be. And I just, and I might be wrong, it might be a very American-centric thing, I just don't agree with authoritarianism. I, I, and that, that comes in, that's fascism, that's uh, far-left authoritarianism, that's whatever. I just don't agree with it. And I fully, I fully believe in the human spirit and, and in people, that people should have some ability to, and I know people on the left, is, <laughs> I'm not trying to trigger you, but to pull themselves up by their bootstraps or something, they should have some ability to do that. It doesn't mean that certain people don't need a little bit more help, just that someone, we should have that ability. And I think that that's essentially what Bitcoin is. In places where systems are not conducive to pulling yourself up by the bootstraps or where you're just sort of stuck living under someone who's making very poor decisions, probably for very bad, either ego-driven reasons or just whatever political reasons, however compromised they are, this is something that exists outside of that system that allows people to make a change in their life. And, and, and I think even, even people in the United States that are in student loan debt, part of the reason we're in that debt is bad financial policy. And a lot of people that crafted that bad financial policy are also the people that never imprisoned anyone for what happened in 2008, 2009. It's the same system at the very least, if not the same people. If we have to get out of student loan debt in the United States, and I think it, it, it is really important personally for me to bring this home, we shouldn't have to because we're not going to earn that money. You know, it's like most people go into, you know, anywhere from 50 to 100 grand in debt if you did a graduate degree, even if you went to a public school or something like that in the United States. So you're not going to necessarily like earn that money by just working a ton of hours. You're going to have to speculate to some level. You're going to have to invest that money. Why should we have to put that money back into the system that did this to us to speculate? Why shouldn't we have another option if we're going to use Bitcoin just as a speculative tool here, just to say like, you know, I hope the number goes up, which is fine. Also, people sometimes shit on that. Like, it's important that the number goes up, obviously, for mining economics and for a lot of reasons. It's really important. It's just also important that people have more purchasing power, and Bitcoin is the sort of antithesis to you know fiat currencies, which are being debased. Um, I should have that. I, I should have that freedom to pull myself up by the bootstraps to invest in something outside of the traditional system that can help preserve my wealth, to not have to give my money back to that system if I don't want to, just to try to get out of the financial system I'm in partially because of that system. It just seems like complete insanity to me. But what I've realized is just. Because most people, you know, whatever, buy Bitcoin, leave it on Coinbase, never really understand like moving it to a hardware wallet, you know, or moving the keys to it or using a hardware wallet, having your own private keys. They never fully get that experience. So they just kind of see Bitcoin as the same thing. Because if you look at your Coinbase account or your Charles Schwab account, they look like the same thing, numbers on a screen, whatever. So unless you fully have that experience and then maybe you send it to someone around the world and you inherently sort of have that connection with them now, you know, you're, you're sort of missing a little bit of this. But I think to get back to the original point is just that I, I think Bitcoin, it, it, it is a solution already, especially for these activists around the world. Um, if you're not familiar, please go back and watch the episode, you know, that Trey did with Ludmila, uh, Ludmila Koslavska of the Open Dialogue Foundation. Um, look at the work Anna Chekovich is doing that the HRF is doing. Um, there are no other ways to get money into these countries. I wish I knew what Bitcoin was in 2000. Well, I knew then I'd be super rich, but <laughs> I think in 2011, I was in Venezuela. I wish, you know, I knew what it was when I couldn't get money from an ATM there. I wish someone could have just sent me some Bitcoin and I could have changed that into whatever the local currency was <coughs> or what, the, you know, to, to Venezuelan Bolivares. Um, so I think it is solving problems. And I, and I do really think I've been borderline downright mean to people like Elizabeth Warren, but I, I really, really think I don't think all hope is lost there. I know that her worldview seems to be in direct contrast to something like Bitcoin existing. But part of the reason that I tell the stories I do, and even part of the reason I try to tell them through outlets like Forbes, is because credibility is, is a thing. You mentioned We were talking a little bit off camera before. It's one thing to publish it for Bitcoin Magazine. You know what you're going to get with Bitcoin Magazine. 
I love Bitcoin Magazine. I work for Bitcoin Magazine full time. I think it's it's a great publication. I'm glad it exists. Um, it, the day that I published my first article in Forbes, all my friends from high school, all my friends, you know, all the family, everyone's like, "Oh, uh, you're not a crazy person." And, and it's like, and I think that it may never change with people like Elizabeth Warren, and that's fine. She won't be here forever. But I do think that you sort of on this sort of level, you need to meet people where they're at. What is the medium they're used to looking at? What is the medium they're used to reading? You know, whatever, whatever website or newspaper or magazine, try to do something there. That's actually from a, from a, from the perspective of if you make content or if you, um, if you write, try. So there's a, there's a, you know, amongst creatives, I think that there's an impulse for all of us to sort of show everyone in the Bitcoin community what we know and what we're doing. That's great. It seems to be the human psychology, you know, it's part of human psychology. It's not necessarily like moving the conversation forward all that much. We can all like, like and reshare each other's stuff on Twitter. And I love that too, because eventually that'll reach more and more people. But, but if you do have an ability to go to a local newspaper that has never published a, a Bitcoin story or a local website or this, and to start reaching out to start reaching the people who do not care about this. And, and I would advise doing it with stories. Tell stories of the circular economies. Tell stories of activists who need this. Because if you start with the blockchain and Austrian economics and this and that, like, just don't even write it. And people do not care. They do not care. Like, and I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm, that's too harsh. Some people do care, for sure. But, but appeal to, start by appealing to emotion. Start by appealing to, like, the human condition where people might be able to say, hey, you know what, if I was in a developing country and cut off from the financial system, yeah, I guess I would want something like Bitcoin to exist, you know, the asset and the network. Um, I think that that's the place to start. And it's, and, and, and my other suggestion is sort of like, and it's push, you know, like, if you do, if you have that desire to get this to really get more people to learn about this, it's going to be hard to get this story out there. A lot of a lot of people either don't understand this or don't want this story out there. But if you do have a bigger paper or bigger publication, something like that, and you do have the skills, or whether it's like, uh, I think Okin Chongarero from, uh, from Namibia just did a little segment on like the morning show in Namibia, uh, where he had like a two minute thing where he just, you know, explained to normal people in Namibia, yeah, this is what Bitcoin is. You see Okin on the show, seems like pretty normal guy, you know, nice guy. Um, that we need more of that. We, you know, a little, a little bit less. We, I like preaching to the choir too, as much as the rest of them, but a little less preaching to the choir and a little more trying to sort of like reach the outside world a little bit, because a lot of what, what, what comes now, we're at a critical point, obviously, after what we've seen with Samurai and, and the crackdowns on the mixing services and Phoenix leaving the US. What comes now is both a legal battle and a war of rhetoric. These are the two things that I think we have to fight. So the legal battle is obviously going to be important. Um, these cases will be critical. Everything from tornado cash to the Bitcoin fog case to the um, to this case with the samurai guys. Um, but the, the rhetoric war is going to be a huge part of this too, especially as Bitcoin becomes more and more of like a, of of an issue at the ballot box. You know, eventually it'll become as much of an issue as like guns or abortion or something like that. Maybe in my mind it will. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but um, you know. So I, I think that, and 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 on that note, I learned this from Ludmila. Please, I love running my mouth. Don't get me wrong. I, I grew up, like I said, New York, you know, hardcore and punk rock scenes, and I think freedom of speech is important. So say what you want. That's fine. 100. percent Get emotional. Say what you want. You have the freedom to do that in the United States and and a lot of other places around the world just be mindful of it. So like in the case of the samurai guys tweeting about how Russian oligarchs are now welcome to use samurai to do whatever they're going to do with their money. It's, it's doing a tremendous disservice to the activists out there who are having conversations with politicians, regulators, international regulators behind closed doors, trying to educate them, trying to say, no, 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 activists need this. Maybe some criminals will use it, but activists need it more. I get that we I get where the antagonism comes from because a lot of us feel powerless so we feel this need to be antagonistic it, it's a natural reaction so it's nothing to like be ashamed of or anything else but just try to understand that there are some people doing really really important work 
trying to help shape rhetoric, narrative, and to br- not just shape rhetoric and narrative, but to, to bring an actual use case for Bitcoin with activists and other people around the world who need it to politicians. So I sat in, I sat in a meeting with Ludmila and the, and the Democratic U.S. Senator, his team, and I watched, I, I was a teacher for 12 years, so I sort of get when someone says they get it and, w- and when they actually get it, when their eyes light up and they have an aha m- a moment versus like, sure, I get it, whatever. And I watched that person change and, and, and then say like, oh, I, I just didn't know any of this. I didn't know any of this. That is, that is immensely powerful. And in, in a civil society, conversations are very, very important. Our rhetoric is very, very important. It, it can also be important in a legal sense. The samurai guys are going to have to face consequences for tweeting that they're, inv- you know, that they're, they're inviting Russian oligarchs to use their service. So if possible, I'm a big um, Eckhart Tolle fan. Eckhart Tolle is like, a, I, don't, I don't know how to describe it. I sound saying he's a spiritual philosopher is not the right way to put it, but he's just, he has a book called The Power of Now. And his advice when it comes to like, when you feel this emotional impulse to do something, just take 30 seconds and be like, is this the way I really want to approach this? Is this the thing I really want to do? So before you do that tweet, you know, fuck this person or that person or blah, blah, blah. Take a second, say like, do I really need to say it like that? Maybe I could say it out loud quietly or whatever in the room I'm in. If you do want to say it like that, go for it. But just sort of try to add to positive civil discourse. If we get to a point where we literally, you know, on whatever levels, you know, where you have to use Bitcoin the way that people were using alcohol during prohibition or something, we're going to get there and that's fine. And we'll, and we'll deal, we'll cross that sort of road when we cross it. We're not there yet though. So for the time being, let's try to engage civilly. Um, let's try not to attack each other in the Bitcoin space. We can, you know, I, I'm in the middle of some of this stuff being a Bitcoin magazine with ordinals and this and that. It's an open source protocol. I, I don't own any ordinals. I don't own any runes or whatever. It just is what it is. I don't really like them. It just is what it is. But l- let's try a little bit less like attacking and a little bit more productivity. You know, like what are you think about like what are you contributing that's positive that's helping to push this forward versus who are you attacking? Um, yeah, again, I'm, I'll, I'll jump off the soapbox there, but I, I do think it's important to keep this in mind. Hi, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitbox. Now, Bitbox is a hardware wallet that's open source, incredibly secure and easy to use, and it's what I'm using to safely secure my Bitcoin in cold storage. Now, I know self-custodying Bitcoin can really be intimidating, but Bitbox is designed for ease of use without compromising on security. It's USB-C compatible and allows you to easily back up and restore your private keys with a micro SD card, which is really cool. Now you can purchase the BitBox using the promo code TPB at the link found in the show notes for 5% off your purchase. And I really want to thank BitBox for their support of the podcast. All right, I'll let you get back to the episode now. What that's, I think that's so important for, for a variety of reasons. And I'm glad you brought up everything you did because there is the reality of a situation and there's, there's social media, right? And this goes back to conversations that I'm passionate about with social media and and things like uh, things like Noster, things like algorithms, all of the different stuff. You know, if I and I'll be honest, um, there have been different times that I haven't intentionally done this. There have there have been times that I've tried to do it less and less because Elizabeth Warren is just one figure of of many, right? But I'm in Massachusetts. I'm a constituent. I, I know my firm belief without talking to her or her team, though I have tried, though Ludmila <laughs> has tried, though others have tried, and I know this. I've talked to so many activists who have said we have reached out to her office and we were not granted a meeting. So we know this, there are good folks that are trying and not an antagonistic, you know, on social media way, like legit off camera, not for the algorithm, not for any press, whatever, um, trying to talk. But every time I've tweeted about Elizabeth Warren, numbers through the roof in terms of engagement Mm. um, or certain things. So I think some Bitcoiners, uh, just any content creator in general, any journalist, any any person on social media, on X or whatever, y- you say some things that are that are kind of a inflammatory statement or whatever, and, and you see those clicks, you get those endorsements. Sure. It's not just a Bitcoin thing, but, yep. but I've seen that within Bitcoin. Sure, that 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 can happen, right? Yeah. But I think too, what the reality of the situation is, Bitcoin is still wildly misunderstood. It's still in a very precarious place of regulatory attack environmental attack, all of these things, right? So we are only feeding into that being inflammatory only. At times it makes (laughs) sense, right? For instance, I think 
Greenpeace USA has gone beyond, beyond reproach totally. in their campaign. And I think a lot of people I respect who are very smart people have said, the gloves are off. Enough is enough. Yeah. We've given you all enough time, enough resources, enough off-camera meeting. I've met with people. I know Daniel Batten and, and many others have done yep. it um, e even more so. Enough is enough, right? It's yep. like, okay, you guys, we've had the education. We actually have the data for you to update your numbers. You're still going. No, we're going to call that out. That's, that's a bit different. Um, but in general, the industry is under scrutiny. I've talked with many mining companies and people on this show and off camera. Um, you know, how Bitcoin miners, yes, they are for-profit companies, but they're going to be under more scrutiny. So you guys should be above reproach in noise, above reproach in how you're using energy, yep. above reproach in everything, because you're going to be scrutinized more than any other industry on the planet right now. Yep. Right. So I think Bitcoiners, if you want to have positive contributions, like you're saying, keeping that in mind. Because right now, the community and Bitcoin as the technology is completely misunderstood, under attack. So the best thing to do is put out constantly, like, like you're doing, like Susie, Decentra Susie, yep. like Ludmila, HRF, so many different people, putting out positive story after positive story after positive story. In the face of extreme hopelessness, Bitcoin is doing blank. That is, that is the best thing we can do yep. because we're, they're completely stumped. And again, this isn't because Bitcoin is perfect. This isn't because Bitcoin is going to fix every problem, yep. but it's wildly misunderstood still. So we're still in the education campaign. Rise above. To totally. be cheesy, Michelle Obama says, they go low, we go high. Yeah, like totally. that, that is a good argument to have. No one's going to be perfect, though. Give yourself some grace. If you have totally. a moment, like I have many times, yeah, where you just go grace. off. Yeah. <laughs> sure, that's okay. Yep. But that's a really important point. If you want to make good change, look to some of the people like Anita Posh. Great example. Yep. Great totally. example. She has so many reasons to be so angry with so many different communities, so many different places where she's seen a lot of examples. It is just story after story of how Bitcoin is used in a peer-to-peer -peer way and what it's doing for people. Yep. Boom. That is, that is winning. That yep. is rising above and sleeping well at night. Yep. Like that, yep. that's incredible. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I, I think you're right. I think there are, I think one of the things that I've learned is that nothing is a monolith. So when you talk about like, oh, the U.S. government is doing this, it's like, no, 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 no. The U.S. government is a very complex web of people and institutions and everything else. And certain people there are in it for the right reasons. Certain people are not. It, it, again, that level of nuance is not going to get you much into engagement on Twitter. If anything, it'll get you some unfollows. So, you know, I get why this isn't often like what goes on on social media, but it is important to note, you know, there, from what I've learned and what I've seen, there are people, I, I mean, again, I, I go back to Ludmila because I think she doesn't get enough recognition for the work that she does. She's had people say to her, okay, senators, I, I'm not going to vote for Elizabeth Warren's bill. That's all we want. I mean, that's all I, I, I know that we want that. And I, I get the other side of the philosophy. I've heard people say, like, it doesn't matter. Why are you paying attention to Elizabeth Warren? We just need to build tech that is, you know, resistant to what politicians say and do. I think that that is true, but it differs on a country by country basis. It depends how many tools your governments have to serve to surveil you. Um, at the same time, I think both should be done. Civil discourse plus build the, po the best possible tools that we can create. Um, I, I don't see why both don't hurt. Um, I, I get the argument just like, why are you even engaging? But I think that it's like when people throw up their hands and leave politics altogether, that's when the Trumps of the world come around. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get it. I'm definitely not going to get into that. I'm not a Donald Trump fan, and beyond, but not even the politics things. My father was an architect and he knew developers in the city who Trump didn't pay and this and that. So my issues with Trump are more personal. Like he just doesn't seem like an ethical business person or whatever, you know, but, but, but I think that when we all just decide to just throw Molotov cocktails or become complacent is when you get leaders like that who will fill the vacuum. That is dangerous. I, I, I have my issues with democracy, especially in the way it currently works with lobbyists and everything else, but it's still better than authoritarianism. So it's like, you know, we need to, we need, we need to sort of consider the context of, of the situation in which we're engaging and then engaging it appropriately. If someone is beyond reproach, like you said, with Greenpeace, which I agree, I think what they've done is just sad. It's completely, uh, it's just, it's gross. Um, I think in a lot of ways, 
maybe no one will ever get through to Elizabeth Warren. That's fine. I mean, she's also what, like 70 something, it, you know, there's also just like, I don't have time to change my mind. And I know that I'm going to get votes for just being this way. So it is what it is. But, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of gray area still. And there's a lot of people who do need to be educated personally. I am a little disappointed that more politicians of the world haven't taken the time to educate themselves. This isn't 2013 with Bitcoin. This is 2024. This isn't even new tech anymore. We're in year 15 of this thing. Like, yeah, we're only now really adopting it and people are seeing ETFs and stuff like that. But, you know, get one of, you know, your aides to give you a, you know, to give you a brief on, you know, like, you know, and have them speak with some people, their friends who are using it. I don't know. I just feel like a little bit more could be done. Um, But again, maybe that's naivete or something like that. It it just is what it is. But I think that approaching it, even if you don't approach things, you know, on Twitter with a ton of nuance, um, you know, try to do it IRL, you know, in real life, try to, especially if you're involved in putting out content in bigger publications or in speaking with people behind the scenes or, or off camera or whatever. I think it really is important because the other side of this is just human psychology. Like people... People are arguing with the samurai guys, like, you know, whatever. They can say that on Twitter if they want. They can, but what is, wh- how do you think the FBI is going to react? Do you think, like, because what if something really bad does happen as a result of the samurai mixer or something, and now you had this evidence of someone saying, like, Russian oligarchs are ready to use it? Psychologically, no one's going to be one of, not, no one's going to want to be the person who didn't act when there was a warning there or something like that. And it's similar on, on a level of discourse. You, you, if you're off-putting to someone, they're not going to want to be on your side. I mean, I, I was counseling people. I, was, I, I did work in social work, and I just feel like, and I studied psychology specifically. We need to acknowledge those things, with that, that we're human beings that are interacting with one another, and that there are certain things that are huge turnoffs you know, that, that we can do to turn people off to it. It doesn't mean that we always have to be like on our best behavior or do something perfectly when we're sort of sharing Bitcoin messaging, but, but sometimes it, it, it would serve us to be a bit more sort of thoughtful in our approach. That's all. I, I think that that's the fairest way to put it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think there there's so much nuance that we just don't have time to get into yeah. with with Samurai. I think it's a completely decent take to say, and, I, and I've said this, it seems like those guys were kind of assholes. They probably didn't have worldviews that I would ascribe to with certain groups and hate groups, I would argue, things like this. The underlying tech and things like that should not suffer because As a result. these guys were assholes. Um, and we talked about this a bit, some nuance, and I encourage everyone that's listening, if you're interested in these type of conversations, like literally a lot of what we talked about, you know, jump into our telegram group. We've got an open public telegram group, <laughs> you know, try to keep it civil and, and things like that, obviously, and do, does a pretty good job of that. Just talking about this, sharing resources, sharing thoughts. Yeah. When the Samurai stuff was coming out, a few of us were like, yeah, it's conflicting knowing that we have this freedom tech and that bad actors can use it. And just like, just like anything, That's right? And, yep. and I think a lot of us believe and I mean, there's a lot of proof in the data, right, that, that we can gather in this open blockchain that, you know, that's more good than bad, but it still sucks. If there's a bad, if someone uses Bitcoin in a bad way, that sucks, right? I don't, it, mm. it's not worth for me individually saying Bitcoin is a failed project. We, we shouldn't use it, right? There's a lot more bad happening with the US dollar than there is with Bitcoin. Totally. Bad things are going to happen in this world. Um, you know, the, we're going to have the, the resistance money guys on. And if you, you know, Craig, um, you know, a- Andrew and, and Bradley in a, in a few months before their, their book release. And I, I was lucky enough to get an advanced copy. And one of the, you know, one of the opening things I think they've shared a bit is, you know, one of the opening lines is uh, Bitcoin is for enemies. Yeah. And then it's also for human rights activists, this and right. that. So they say that right off the bat, it is for enemies, yep. but it's also for blank, 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 you know, all of this list of really positive things. Yep. So I think we have to get comfortable in this world as we have with the internet. That the internet is a is a good. It also can be used for bad. Yeah, cell phones or in- encrypted communication for good and for bad. Totally. We're just at the phase where we're talking about that with with money. We were yeah. in a, under a private money uh, system of you know transacting in in cash and you know cash societies. Back to okay, everything should be kind of public and government surveilled. Getting yep. a little too comfortable with that. Yep. Now we're bringing it back to the forefront. What is an electronic cash system yep. that can also use privacy tools look like? And will we as a people in democracies around the world say, yes, we'd like to live in that world? Or 
would we like to say no we would not and yeah. i just like you think that while we're still under a democracy or quasi democracy or, or whatever we have a right to say something totally. and, and last point i'll say on that ludmila once she said this to me it really i was talking to you about priorities and what i should what i should focus on yeah. ludmila was like to be in a democracy and then to not utilize your vote or your voice or your ability to meet with a local city councilor or whatever, uh, then to see them rolling out some of these things and to not say anything. She's right. like, folks in authoritarian regimes would kill to right. be able to have that access <laughs> to do that without fear of death, yep. which in the US, we are able to do that without fear of death. Sure, some people will say, I can get fired if I say something, lame, you know, this yep. and that. We're, we're talking about in general, you have a right to write to your city councilor, your senator, and usually a staffer will get back to you. There's some yep. mandates that yep. are involved with that, right? People can say it won't do much. It might not, right? But we have the ability to try. And I am yep. completely under that, you know, uh, belief as well is that we, we should do something. There's a lot. It's hell. That's one of the main reasons I wanted to do this podcast. I was like, there's yep. a lot of folks on the left that are being led astray by these narratives. And I think I'm going to do whatever I can, even if five listen and become more open. That's great. That's five totally. more than would have would have done that before. That one senator that you said that that you and Ludmila and, and many others have met with um, or different, you know, reps and senators, that's fantastic. That's gonna have effects at some point. But I think everyone listening to this, if you really care about the things we're talking about in these rights, there's always something you can do. Now, don't lose sleep at night. Don't feel that you can't, you know, enjoy time with your family, enjoy the good things in life. Like take care of yourself, take yeah. care of your your health. Try not to put all of this on your shoulders as so many have, I think, all the time. Um, but there's there's stuff you can do at, at any scale. And totally. we're still in a we're still in a democracy of sorts. Let's let's use that. We're citizens. Let's stand up for our rights. Yep. That's that's what we're about. A hundred percent. There's one thing I could add. It's a phrase that often got brought up in social work school, the uh, let's get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, I, I, I wanna add that because I agree. I, but again, there's nuance. Don't lose sleep at night or try not to lose sleep at night. I mean, I think state of the world often leads to that one way or another. But the other side of it is that you might need to have some uncomfortable conversations. And again, having them with toned down rhetoric is often the best approach in my experience. Um, not necessarily diluting your message, but just the way that you put it out there. And also, yeah, I think that fear of like, I might get fired, I might this, I might that these are real fears, no question. But I would just say, think about it this way. Like you don't, you don't have to say something if you're going to share a thought online in an offensive way, in a way that might make your job sort of, I don't know, question who you are, your integrity. But, you know, rhetoric is a game in and of itself. Find the way that feels right for you to say it. What is your unique perspective? Because you're saying something that maybe is controversial or um, maybe people don't understand y your role in all of this might be sort of like just bringing your perspective to the table in a mild mannered way, you know, and, and, and sometimes it just, that requires just thinking a little bit about the way you want to phrase something. And I think that there's a lot of space for that. You know, I think that there's, it's important, even if you do phrase something in a whatever way, and maybe the the tweet or whatever doesn't get as much traction. It doesn't mean people didn't see it. And I think it goes back to the point you were just making. If I only reach five people, that was the way I looked at my podcast as well. And I've been writing a sub stack for uh, three years. Um, I never cared how many people it reached. Obviously you wanted to reach more in that. Like, I hope this message spreads, but I still love pressing, uploading a video to YouTube or pressing publish at sub stack. I still love that feeling of like, I know this is going to reach some people. I don't know what impact it's going to have, but this many people, X number of people are still reading it. So that's good, you know, and, and it, it, it really, you know, it, it becomes a different game when you're doing, you know, when you're working full time as a writer and everything else. And, and I know what compromises I have to make and I'm comfortable with those things. But, you know, if you do have something to say, honestly, just be a part of the conversation. This is something I told my students over and over and over don't think about the world so much as like us and that or like me and them like be be them be a part of the conversation be be you know and it's it's hard the other day i was on a, a spaces with one of the bigger names in this space 
um, maybe the biggest names, like, and I won't get into it, um, who it was. And I still felt that urge of like, oh, I don't know, I shouldn't say anything here. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm, I write, I do this full time. It's hard, you know, it's hard to speak up on multiple levels. It's definitely hard, but, and I'm sure you've been through this, Trey, like putting yourself out there to the level that you do, you're opening yourself up to criticism. You're opening yourself up to a whole bunch of stuff that is going to take a bit of an emotional toll on you. Don't put yourself in a position where you're, you end up on like, you know, prescription medication because you put yourself out there and you're utterly vulnerable. But, but I think, but a little bit of discomfort, putting something out there that maybe people don't fully understand yet and, and you're trying to explain it you're not going to get it right the first time or chances are you're not going to get it perfect it takes time to sort of refine your rhetoric and all of that but um a little bit of discomfort i think also just comes with the with the territory here whether that's telling family members about this or anything else just don't make it too much discomfort and take a step back and, and do stuff to care for yourself if it does feel like it's overwhelming on some level yeah and that's the that's the first and foremost because there's so many people that have come in, come and gone in in bitcoin in terms of like a vocal community community member for mental health stuff I and mean, we're talking about a lot of bitcoin engagement is on social media or yep. through online publications or sure so you know perhaps local local meetups would have but but people get information more easily through through books that are shipped through podcasts through yep. following social media accounts that's kind of how we engage in new new thoughts and new paradigms these days seeing something online on the internet or or a book that you saw online something like that right but i would say my opinion on this is we do still need a lot of different people in in bitcoin advocating for these things right that's one of the reasons that i started speaking up as a progressive person of of the left you know i'd love for the day when i don't have to say that as much in, in bitcoin right i don't love saying it all that much, but I did because I knew that a lot of people didn't see their values in a community or in this system. When that's obviously very antithetical, it's an open source tool. It's not a political party or an ideology, or you have to be like a carnivore or whatever. Obviously, like I'm a progressive, I'm a vegan, I'm from New England, all of these things put me in the category of not fitting into the typical Bitcoin norm, not to mention women, not to mention different gay rights activists I've talked to about how Bitcoin can be a tool for them. Yep. Um, different uh, abortion rights that I've that I've talked about, should Trump come to office, should a tax be, uh, you know, taken financially against places like Planned Parenthood. Yep. I think there are a lot of different communities that could benefit from Bitcoin. And if anyone is listening, I would encourage you think about making your voice a little more well known to this community. Yep. But again, I understand the emotional and the, the the risks, the trade-offs for some people in authoritarian regimes, it's literally life and death, life right? And about death, how yeah. they communicate and use the, these tools. Um, and the last thing I wanted to make sure to say too, from this, I, I've been saying it a little bit on Noster and Twitter recently, especially with like samurai cases, things like this, you know, using Bitcoin, writing code, me talking on this podcast, it is not illegal, right? That's right. not... I don't want to say I don't care about that or that I do care about that. It, it's more like all of these are rights that we have just on this conversation in the U.S. and a lot of countries around the world. We have a freedom of speech. We have a, a right to assemble. We have freedom of the press. Um, everything within Bitcoin, using Bitcoin, taking Bitcoin into self-custody, using your money, yep. uh, using these things. Th- these are all legal things. It isn't anything the government granted to us. These are inalienable rights that, that we had and that the country mm-hmm. is founded on. So everything I'm saying, I'm not saying okay, we are defying the state by using Bitcoin right now. That's not what I'm saying. I'm actually like, no, we are actually adhering to <laughs> human rights, to the Bill of Rights, to the yep. Constitution, everything that we have, we as Americans are born into, that yep. immigrants in this country have rights to. There's a lot of different things. So everything I'm saying, very comfortable, I am out, this is my name, this is my real name, like all of these choices I'm making, I'm very comfortable in the assertion that these are, these are legal. And whenever folks, whether it's Elizabeth Warren or others, would like to presume or speak to suggest that these things are not, right. they're just incorrect. They're totally. just incorrect. Unless the courts would like to decide and change. And then we as people still can then do things as citizens of America, 100%. Uh, based on who we vote for, based on these lawmakers, things like this. So if anyone, you know, I was having this conversation with my life recently, I was like, hey, make no mistake, like, I'm actually following the law completely and they are very out of line suggesting anything other than that in terms of any debates on Bitcoin self-custody. So just like you said, 
there are some legal battles that are coming out in terms of perhaps self-custody, perhaps other things down the road. I think they're poorly mistaken. Yep. Uh, should different verdicts come out, which we are a ways away from, right? So people should have patience. People should, I think, stand up and not pretend that we're criminals right now. <laughs> we are not. We're law-abiding yep. citizens that actually care about the world. And we're just 100%. trying to use a tool that's pretty beneficial to the world. So I also really wanted to say that. Um, not because I'm scared of any ramifications or scared of some Fed showing up to my door, but just to say, like, I'm not trying to pretend like, you know, this is illegal. It, it is not. I'm very frustrated at folks that would suggest it could be. It's very right. antithetical it's to beautiful way America, to, put it. to human yep. rights, things like that. Yep, 100%. And I think also it's funny uh, listening to you talk about this, you know, talking about freedoms and America and this and that, like, you know, you don't often hear this sort of talk. I mean, and obviously you're talking about it with great nuance and I totally get where you're coming from. But you don't often, I did not often hear this talk in some of this, when I was at social work school or something like that, it was just inherently thought of that, like America is an evil thing because of, for very real reasons, genocide and slavery, not allowing women to vote. There are very, America has scars that are, that are tremendous and brutal and everything else, but it also has the civil rights movement. It's also, we also are, you know, sort of led the way I don't want to I hope please don't get I don't get this wrong but sort of you know I guess led the way with things like gay marriage and and you know there it's not don't look at things again as 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 if it's all good or all bad talking about America and freedom and our rights these are really really important things whether you're on the left or the right doesn't really matter but I do wish people on the left would talk about them a little bit more because just advocating for like, no, there should be no inequality and the government should have more control of this and that, it's the same sort of mentality that gave rise to someone like Chavez. It's the same, you know, that, that, that has allowed what's transpired in Venezuela to transpire. The word empowerment gets thrown around a lot these days. Empowerment, I really believe, is, is, is most beneficial at, at the personal level. So start, you know, build your own coalitions, build your own groups, do education at, at local levels. Maybe in this, you know, fourth turning or this big shift we're seeing, maybe that's the trend. Maybe we go back to sort of really talking to each other again and do, and 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 building stuff together on, on a local level. I hope it is. I mean, I, that's, that's where I started and where I hope to sort of have the most effect. Um, but I think also, if you want to see the power of that, look at Bitcoin Beach, look at Bitcoin Akasi. Look at uh, Bitcoin Witsand, look at all the circu circular Bitcoin economies, just Google circular Bitcoin economies, or even, you know, attend a Bitcoin meetup where people will, you know, go back to that sort of vibe of like people doing stuff, building communities, helping one another, being there for one another, using Bitcoin as a tool, educating one another about Bitcoin. Not that this is only about Bitcoin. Um, and I think you'll, I think you'll see some level of inspiration and, and you could go back to a number of episodes of of guests that Trey has had on the podcast here to, to, to learn from some of those people. Um, you could, some of the work that I do features th those people, but it, I haven't met one person that's not utterly inspired by it. I, I, you know, every piece I've written or thing I've shared, people listen to it. And they, and the first thing most of them say are like, dude, I had no idea. I, I, I trained, I'm a triathlete. I trained with a, a, a broadcast journalist from uh, CBS, like, uber mainstream media. She comes to some of the Bitcoin events that I host and, and she constantly asks me like, whatever you write, send it to me. She's like, I do not get this stuff. I do not know that this narrative is taking, you know, that, that, that circular economies <laughs> exist, this and that. And that'll be my last point is just like, we are in a bubble. <laughs> only 5% of the people in the world own Bitcoin. I would say only 1% probably actually care about it. And I think that's being generous. So understand that you're in a bubble, lead with a story when it comes to like what Bitcoin is and all that kind of stuff. And, and give people time. You know, they're not, a lot of people aren't going to get it overnight. Again, might not have the time to get it or just the bandwidth to get it. Um, but don't, don't dismiss people if they don't get it right away. Um, try to do the best you can to sort of share the best possible information to educate and, and to try to reach them on that emotional level through story. So I will leave it there. Yeah, I think that's a great place to leave it. And if, if folks have more questions about this, need more opportunities for inspiration, just have questions about where to go to next. Any of our episodes are just little snapshots, right? Yes. There's so many other books and resources. Honestly, one of the best ways too is like, uh, I, I mentioned our, our Telegram group that is in the show notes. So you can you can jump on our Telegram group, just start asking questions. We have people all over the world in that that are very pro-social, pro-environment group in terms of what, what Bitcoin is doing in the world. 
sure Frank would love to hear from you, connect directly with Frank or myself. So on um, that, but, could I actually shout out, uh, I'm in that Telegram yes. group. And if you have a question yep. for me personally, if, after you watch this episode, um, I, it's just not at my name. It's at New Renaissance Capital. So N-E-W-R-E-R-E-N-A-I-S-S-A-N-C-E-C-A-P-I-T-A-L. Um, so that's that's me on Telegram. So And I'm in that group. So just do me a favor and at me. I'm in like, uh, thanks to a mutual friend of, of Trey and mine, Trey tray in mine i think that's right um uh thanks a mutual friend of ours daniel from uh, who does work with PubKey and and helps out with the podcast for trey um i'm in a billion telegram groups i can't really respond unless somebody actually pings me so if there's something that i said here that resonated with you or you have a question or you want me to follow up please join the progressive bitcoiner telegram group and just ping me and i'm happy i'll be happy to respond to your questions it might take a little bit of time but I'm, i'm definitely happy to get back to you for sure that's great. Um, for, for the, so I'll put, you know, your stuff in the show notes as well on, you know, where to find your publications, but anywhere else you want to, you want to send people to in terms of following along with, with your great thoughts, your work. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. I mean, if you Google my name, I write for, I, I was writing for Coindesk for a little bit. Um, Coindesk, Bitcoin Magazine, Forbes. Uh, I think my, there's a writer's profile in all of those. Um, I write a Substack still every week. I mostly just include the articles I write because writing another article on a Sunday after writing all week no longer feels, it's no longer a very pleasant thought or feeling. Um, you could feel free to find me, Frank Corva at Substack. Uh, you know, just Google that if you want to join. That'll just be an overview. Like I said, I'll just be sending you links to my articles. Um, I think that's it. Twitter at Frank Corva. Um, yeah, I mean, if you Google me, I think all the stuff comes up or whatever. So, um, but yeah, I also just want to say thank you so much for having me on here. Um, truly an honor. Um, again, please support what Trey does, uh, whether it's, you know, zapping some sats or, or, or listening or sharing this. Um, I was podcasting for a while. This stuff takes a lot of work for people who aren't um, familiar with what it takes to make a podcast, especially one with video. So please don't take this for granted what he's doing. If you really support the message, do what you can to amplify it. I think it's, it's, I think you might, you have some sponsors and stuff, but honestly, almost no level of sponsorship really sort of will support the amount of work that goes into not only creating this thing, but promoting it and everything else. So please, if you have any ideas for, you know, please just support what Trey is doing. It's super important. And he has really, really, you know, so many of the the guests he's had on are, are friends of mine and people whose voices really need to be amplified. So please take part in that process of amplifying them. Frank, uh, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. This was such a great chat. I think our audience will will love this. And folks, do the same for Frank's work of putting out really, really great work on the most important things around the world in terms of Bitcoin. So thank you so much for for coming on. I know you got to jump off. You've got a busy, busy day. Um, but, I, but I so appreciate this conversation. And thank you, Daniel, for for connecting us. Um, and can't wait to see you at some time. Gosh, sometime this year. I, I promise yeah. you, I was telling Daniel, it's been crazy with family stuff and, and work stuff. But We'll, we'll hang out. We'll, we'll go grab some, uh, you know, some vegan, vegan lunch food. down in vegan, New York City. Vegan dinner on me, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Frank. All right, guys. Take it easy. 